A reading from Peter's first letter to the early church, chapter 5. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Nathan. I'm on staff here at the church. And uh, today I want to talk to you about one thing that I think most people, if not nearly every person, is missing. And it's the one thing that all of our relationships desperately need. It's what our country needs more of. It's what your company needs more of. It's what your family needs more of. It is definitely what you want for your children that will give them and lead them towards a good and pleasing kind of life. Now, that's how I'm told you're supposed to start these kind of sermons, not the way I usually do with some kind of obscure historical event that just, just depresses everybody. <laughs> but today, we're going to try and start this way, all right? We're going to talk about something uh, that I think everybody really needs a little more of. But what's interesting is, is that when you look at lists of qualities that a parent needs or really qualities that children need to go on to live good and happy and successful lives, which is what most of us kind of thought was the point of parenting, was to try and set them up for success and to be happy, you will never see what we're talking about today on any of those lists. What I'm talking about is humility. Uh, Margot uh, McCall, who was the former commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, under President Reagan, just recently wrote a book uh, because she herself raised a very successful entrepreneur, and she wrote a book called Raising an Entrepreneur, 10 Rules for Nurturing Risk Takers, Problem Solvers, and Change Makers. And that's a really good enticing title. And some of you are going to Amazon right now to buy it because that's what you want. I want a good change maker, problem solver, risk taker. McCall writes in just kind of the preface of the whole thing, how to help your kid develop the skills they need to reach their full potential, which in our culture is the highest value. It is the ultimate virtue that you could reach your full potential. Be all you can be. We want to be successful and to accomplish every dream and every goal we've ever had. And we want five easy steps to really get there. And if you're not the kind of person that's very ambitious and you're not worried about that, the way it comes out is you need to follow your heart, right? You need to follow your bliss. You need to do what makes you happy. You need to find your true self and kind of live in that authentic self. We want to be happy. We want to be successful. And so... McCall studied uh, 70 parents who raised highly accomplished adults, including many who were entrepreneurs and CEOs, and she identifies for her readers, if your kid has these five traits, they're destined for success. That's a promise right there, guys. They are destined for success if they have these five traits. So I'm going to tell you what they are. And if you, you're not going to listen to anything else I say, but you're going to write these down. These are what they are. If your child is per persistent, they don't give up. If they're curious, if they have a passion, if they're self-starters, and if they're risk takers, then they are destined to be successful in life. And the goal of this book that I have not read 
is to, I assume, help you as the parent figure out if you got a dud of a kid, how do you make sure you can instill them with all of these traits so that they're not so much of a loser, right? But what no book that you're going to read on reaching your full potential or accomplishing all your goals or being successful is going to talk to you about is what Peter says is critical for every church to have. Humility. Partly, I think that's because humility is something that is pretty hard for us to define. Most of the time, we think of it as just kind of having a low view of yourself, right? You have a low view of your own self-importance. You walk around telling people all the time, you know, you're self-deprecating and saying, oh, I don't, I don't, don't think about me. I'm not that important. Or we think it's just someone who doesn't think very highly of themselves. And most of the time, we see humility in terms of what it's opposed to, Right? We think of people who are arrogant, right? We think of people who are very boastful, people who are very conceited, right? And so most of us don't think that much about humility because we think, well, I'm pretty humble because I'm not that conceited. I'm not the arrogant person, right? Everyone else is the arrogant person. But the truth is humility is not just not being conceited. Humility is a virtue that we primarily see in Christ, That it is Christ who is truly gentle and humble in heart. C.S. Lewis is often quoted as having said, Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Which I do think is a pretty helpful definition of humility. It's not, I go around just thinking low things about myself like I don't matter. It's just I don't spend all my time thinking about me. Right, That the humble person is the one who is not primarily interested in what they can get out of another person or what they're getting out of a situation. Right, Because primarily, they're thinking about the other person. Right, They are truly selfless. And I do think this is a helpful definition. The problem is, we don't actually have a record that he ever even said this. This is not actually what he said. What Lewis actually wrote, I think, is even more helpful. It's just not as succinct, so you won't be able to memorize it as well. This is what Lewis wrote in his book, Mere Christianity, that a person who is truly humble, they won't look like what most of us think a humble person is. He said, probably all you will think about him, and I do want to tell you, I really considered doing this in a British accent because he's British, but I chose not to, okay? So I just wanted you to know that ahead of time. Probably, no, okay, sorry. (laughs) Probably all you will think about him is that he seemed a cheerful, intelligent chap, British, who took a real interest in what you said to him. If you do dislike him, it will be because you feel a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. He will not be thinking about humility. He will just not be thinking about himself at all. Humility is the ability to reorient my thoughts and my perception of others and my, the world around me in such a way that I'm not even in the picture. I do not filter everything through, well, how did that make me feel? How, how did that help me out? What does what, what they're saying have to do with me? What, what is, how is this conversation really going to affect me, this decision going to affect me? It's the ability to not even consider yourself, or as the Apostle Paul said it to a church in the ancient Roman colony of Philippi, he said, you should do nothing out of selfish ambition, or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. This is how you do it. You look not to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Which, once again, most of us don't think we have a problem with because it starts with saying do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, and no one wants to think of themselves as selfish or vain or conceited. And so we think we don't really have any problem because I'm not conceited. But as C.S. Lewis phrases it in that same section, he says, if you are the person who thinks you are not conceited, it means you are very conceited indeed. Why is that? Because who are you thinking about? It's like that old game, right, where someone says, hey, the whole point of the game is you do not think about a big purple elephant, all right? Don't think about a big purple elephant. And every time I say, don't think of the big purple elephant, there's part of you telling yourself, don't think about a big purple elephant. But by the nature of you telling yourself not to think about a big purple elephant, you're only thinking about the big purple elephant. 
Humility is not something you get more of by sitting around going, be more humble, be more humble, be more humble. I need to do this is what I need to do. Because in the end, pride by its nature will tell me, well, you're the only one who's not proud. I mean, your kids are, your spouse is, everyone you meet, they're selfish. You are not, you're always thinking about everyone else. You're the only one who cares about others. Pride says things like, I'm always doing for others. When's someone ever going to do something for me? When's anyone ever going to think about me? Pride sounds a lot like martyrdom, a lot like judgment of others. It's always having to get your way. It's always having to have the last word. Or it's always staying silent because no one listens to my opinion anyway. Why would I speak? No one wants to hear what I have to say. And the truth is you can see this clearly. All of us can see it clearly in everyone else, which is why whenever you're in an argument with someone else, they're the selfish one. They're the only one who can think about themselves and they don't see how this problem affects you and your life. They're so selfish. But for a moment, could you imagine how your workplace would change if you could actually be truly happy for the person who does less work than you and got the pay raise when you didn't? because maybe their pay raise had nothing to do with you. How would your marriage be different if that conflict that keeps coming up again and again, and you guys keep butting heads on it, and then eventually you just said, you know what? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we should try it your way, and not in a sarcastic way, not in a way, in a genuine, actual belief that maybe you don't have all the answers. Maybe someone else knows. If you got preteens, You got teenagers, let's be honest, you got adult children. How would your conversations change if you said, you know, I'm going to stop nagging on this. I'm going to stop harping on that one issue over and over again. And instead, I'm just going to let it go. Because maybe the way they talk or the way they don't talk to you or maybe the way they dress or the way they act or the way they cut their hair or maybe how they don't come around as much as you want them to, or maybe how they choose to raise their children. Maybe it ain't about you. Maybe not everything that frustrates you is disrespectful to you as a person because maybe no one else is thinking about you as much as you are thinking about you. That's the question of humility. See, relationships, communities, societies thrive when at least one person, if not more people, are truly humble. When people choose to say, I'm going to stop this kind of tug of war to get my way and pull you to my side of the argument. When relationships are not full of these obligations and these failed expectations, you keep telling everyone how they've disappointed you and let you down, where the tension actually leaves the room because when everyone's pulling on the rope, you just let go and say, this ain't about me. And it's not just that the pressure goes down. Your personal enjoyment of life goes through the roof. Suddenly, you're able to enjoy life really easily because the pressure has gone down. And not for the other person, for you. Because the reason you're pulling on that rope so hard is you are convinced, even though Kelly said it at the beginning, that God's the one who holds your life together, you are convinced you are the one that holds your life together. And your life is only good and pleasing and right if you make sure you can, you can be successful enough to get everyone else and all of life and even God himself to do everything you want him to do. And maybe instead you were meant to receive life as a gift to be enjoyed. And this is not just important for your family or your marriage, it is necessary for the church. In the closing section of his letter to a group of early churches that are suffering loss and persecution, Peter once again wants to encourage those communities of Jesus followers to hold strong, to remain a community that is holy and set apart, purified from the sin and evil of the world around them, and that is able to stand strong and firm in their faith in the face of persecution. And so Peter addresses the leaders in the church, what he calls the elders of the church. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Peter is addressing people with power and authority and influence in these communities to see themselves as shepherds, to lead by example, not by intimidation or manipulation. 
It was common in the ancient world that social groups and communities, like the early church, were led by elders who used their power and authority to gain wealth and privilege and to use others. Could you imagine corporations or politicians in our day doing the same thing? It's unthinkable. Peter wants to make sure that these church communities are holy, set apart and purified from the corruption of the culture around them. So he instructs these leaders to see themselves shepherds and servants, not as many kings. And then Peter reminds them of the example that was set for them. And when the chief shepherd, who is Jesus, appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Peter says, having power and authority within the church, having influence in Jesus' community, is not a privilege to be used to your own advantage. It's a call to be more like your chief shepherd, who used his power and authority to lay his life down for us. Leadership is about leading the way in selfless, self-giving love and service to others for the sake of King Jesus. But this only becomes possible when, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. In a Christ-like community, those in authority can still guide and shepherd the flock without lording their power over others. Because those who are younger, or simply younger in the faith, recognize the value of the elders. So there's no power struggle. There's no tug of war. Everyone submits to one another. The reason this doesn't feel possible is because all of our communities and governments and organizations are built on mutual self-interest. I'll recognize your authority as long as you make rules and laws that agree with or that benefit me. And most of us think that secretly, everyone in power is trying to figure out how to keep those underneath them happy while getting as much as they can for themselves. And so, as long as it's mutually beneficial, we'll keep you in power. But when it's not, rebellion is coming. And this is why humility can really only grow in a community where Christ is king. Humble people are formed in an environment where all people are first submitted to Christ and all power and authority derives from him. This is why Peter instructs both groups of people, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. You choose to value others above yourselves. If you have power and authority, don't spend your time thinking how you can use it for yourself. Think of how you can use your privilege to help those who don't have any. If you're younger, don't fight to get your way. Simply submit to those God has put in authority because you trust that they too are submitted to King Jesus. And if all of you humble yourselves and submit to Christ as King, in due time, he will lift you all up which is important because when you are facing persecution like these churches Peter writes to, or when you live in a culture like we do that tells you that a good and pleasing life is found in pursuing your own success and happiness or the success and happiness of those you love, the gravitational pull of life makes you focus on yourself and what you want, and you become proud and you are opposed to what God wants. And when this happens to believers, it infects the church and the vessel God chose to carry the cure for a broken and dying world becomes infected with the same sickness as the world around it. And that is a tragedy. So let's talk pretty practically about humility here. Humility is what your children need from you. It's what your spouse needs from you. It's what our world needs from every believer, but as I've already said, becoming a humble person is not something you go out and just grab for yourself. It is not an accomplishment you can go out and achieve and every day go, was I more humble today than I was the day before? You can't become more humble by trying harder. It is a gift of grace that comes from Christ because humility requires a relationship. It requires another person for me to think about. Which is why Peter says the path to, hum to humbling yourselves is to do so under God's mighty hand. Humility begins by placing yourself under the authority of God that you say, there is no tug of war between me and God. I live for him above all other things. I do not look to my own interests. I look to his interests. What is his will to be done? I'm not concerned with getting my way. I'm concerned that God's will would be done, which is really tough to do. I mean, 
when you're suffering persecution like these believers are. Because maybe God's will is that you would preach the gospel in such a way that the greatest witness you have of God's kingdom is that you would give your life preaching in a Roman Colosseum. That really requires a lot of humility. That really requires, I'm not looking for my own interest. I'm looking for the interest of someone else. But so does choosing to say, maybe the best witness to this world, to my neighbors, to my coworkers, to my own children of God's loving faithfulness is for me to stay in a marriage that is no longer personally satisfying to me or has become more difficult for me than it is enjoyable. It takes a lot of humility to stay in that place or to say maybe the best witness to the world or to my children of my obedience to God is when I choose to say, hey, we don't do ball games on the weekend because we're, we're showing up to serve at church on Sunday. It requires humility to say, hey, this life is not about what I want. It's not even about what I think will be most enjoyable for my kids or set them up for the most successful future. This life is about God and his interests above all other things, which is why Peter says for believers, hey, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And see, when you're in the middle where you're not focused on your own interest, there are times you start to wonder, does anyone care about me? See, the only way I've found to spend any amount of my time not just focused on myself and worried about my kids and worried about what's going to happen in their future and in my life or how I can get what I want out of any situation is simply to turn those cares over the moment they come to my head to God to simply pray, God, I want you to know this is really what I want. God, I want this respect or this admiration from this other person and there's this thing in me that wants to fight for it and pull on that rope and tug them to my side of the argument so that they respect me or God, I really want this opportunity to go my way and it seems to be all I can think about right now or God, I want my kids to do well and I want them to look back on their childhood and be very thankful for it and not feel like they missed out on anything and God, I want my wife to respond to me in this way or that way but I know that this life, it is not about my will. It is about your will and so god may your will be done not mine and because i know that you care for me i can live with open hands instead of holding on to the rope and know that whatever i receive it is a gift or it is an opportunity for me to trust you more it is either a blessing to me to receive and enjoy or is an opportunity to once again turn to you in prayer but i will not force my way but I want to be even more direct. This is not just about what your family needs from you. It is about us as a church, what we need from one another. That our life together as a church, it is meant to be the witness to the world around us that this life is not about just trying to squeeze as much success and happiness and great experiences as you can out of your short years on this life. Jesus says, hey, if you try to hang on to your life, if you try to take hold of your life and you try to squeeze every bit of enjoyment, every bit of pleasure you can, everything you can out of this life, you will eventually lose it. But he says, if you give up your life for my sake, for the sake of my kingdom, you will find a life that is truly rich and satisfying. When you choose to say, I'm going to invest my time, my energy, my money into what God values, what he cares about, you will find a life that is true life. And so if we believe that, I'm talking about us as believers, if we believe that to be true, then maybe the best witness of that, maybe the best witness of that must be our lives together. And that requires us to be humble enough to serve and to invest, and to give of ourselves, to make this community the kind of faithful witness to say that God's kingdom is where life is found. So as, Paul, uh, as Peter did here, I want to say to you who are young, not younger than me, because there aren't a lot of you in the room that are younger than me, but those of you who are young, maybe your moms and dads, or you got young children in your life right now, your interests right now, are about those kids and setting them up for success. Here's maybe what humility requires of you. It may require that your weekends be more about just living for the weekend. Maybe you need to be more invested here than just 
once a month or one hour a week. It is so normal in our world when you think that life is about squeezing out every drop of enjoyment and experience and success that you can out of it to start doing what our world does and say, well, you live for the weekend. But us, we no longer live for ourselves. We have died to the ways of this world, and so we no longer live for ourselves or for the weekend. And so the weekend is not just another opportunity for another trip to the beach or another ball tournament or just more family time on Sunday mornings. It is a time to invest in God's community. I am so thankful for the young moms and dads who are choosing to invest their weekends and not just in their family and their family's interests. They are invested in other people's families, other moms and dads who show up here on Sunday, other kids who are sitting in our children's ministry, other people's students who serve here and are involved here. They're trying to, even families they don't know that are walking in on Sunday, they want to make sure there is a smiling face waiting for them. And I know there are times that you wonder as a mom or a dad, maybe if family time is better spent at the beach or at the ball field or chilling at home in your PJs, but you have chosen that this life will not be about you. That this life will not just be about you and you are not content to watch. Older generations carry all of the weight of serving on Sunday morning. You're not just content to watch other people who have done this for 30 years go, well, they're taking care of it, so I can just come and be a part of it. You are doing more than you know every Sunday that you show up. But there are many of you, young moms and dads, this is not your experience of church. And so humility may require that you get more involved than you are right now. I'll be even more direct. We need some of you dads to start serving in children's ministry even if you already serve somewhere else right now. We need more dads to get involved because we know, and the studies just say, that having adult men involved in the lives of young children in their faith, it drastically changes their experience of faith. And so we need you to get involved. And this is where humility kicks in because maybe you don't like kids that aren't your own. Maybe you don't even like your own kids. (laughs) But this ain't about you. Could you get invested in the life of someone else's kids and say, I will love and I will serve you and make sure you have the opportunity to grow up knowing that there is life in Jesus and in his kingdom. And it may not be enjoyable. But can you look to the interests of someone else and get involved? I'll tell you this, for the sake of your kids, can you get more involved and show them this is what it means to follow Jesus? It's I lay aside my life for his life. I lay aside my will for his will. But now to you who are not so young, the rest of you, and I won't say the word you don't want me to say, but those of you who are not quite as young as me, uh, those of you who have a lot more time, and you've got more money, and because of your time in this church, you've got influence, we need you to be humble. We need you to look to the interest of others as well. If young families need to stop living for the weekend, you got to stop living for retirement. You got to stop choosing to say, hey, I did my serving, I did my time, and now it's me time. You've got more time than you've ever had before, and it is mostly spent on you and all the things you didn't get to do while you were working. The people who inspire me the most in our church are the grandparents whose children and grandchildren do not come to this church or maybe any church anymore, but they choose, I'm going to invest in someone else's kids. I'm going to invest in someone else's grandkids, in my kids. People who choose to say, hey, my body's a little achy every Sunday, but I'm going to stand in the parking lot in the heat or I'm going to get on a nursery floor, or maybe some of you should not be getting on the nursery floor, but you're going to sit in a rocking chair, and you're going to hold someone else's kids, and you're going to sing songs to them, like, Jesus loves me, so that they would know. These are people who've said, I no longer live for myself, and we need more of this. We need more people who would humble themselves because life is not about how comfortable your life after retirement is. 
It is about how could you give your life away just as your Lord did for you? So could you invest in what God is doing here? Could you serve? Could you get in a small group and not just with other people your age? Could you get involved with some of these younger people you don't want to be around? Could you get involved in the lives of some young moms and dads or serve their children on Sundays the way you hope that someone would do for your children and your grandchildren? For years we had a saying around our church that went, it's not about you. Here's another one. If you're not dead, you're not done. If you're not dead, you're not done. And God is not done with you. God has so much more life left for you to live. And I want to close with this warning from Peter on why we have to stay humble in the church. He says this, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour him. So resist him, standing firm in the faith. Peter is warning these believers who are under persecution. He's like, you guys got to stay alert. All of this pressure, all of this stuff that is coming towards you that makes you want to just drop all of this and go back to life the way it was before you in the church, it is not neutral pressure. These are not neutral decisions. You, the moment you walk away, your enemy is waiting to devour you. And I believe this is true not just for cultures that suffer under persecution, but cultures that suffer under the oppression of too many choices. We have so many options that promise us this will lead to a good and pleasing life and this will lead to a good and pleasing life. And every one of them you must be alert and stay sober-minded about because it is your enemy trying to drag you away because there is only one. There is only one person who leads to life that is good and pleasing and rich and satisfying. Jesus is the only source of life, and his way is the way of the kingdom, the way of the cross, the choice to say, I will lay down my rights, what I could do for myself, my will, and I will follow God's will for my life. And our enemy is prowling around like a roaring lion. He is trying to entice believers away from this way of life so he can steal and kill and destroy the goodness that God has for your life. So be alert. Because the greatest threat to the faith of the next generation, it is not gender identity. And it is not CRT. And it is not changing cultural values. It is the lie that this life is all about you. It is the lie that your job in this life is to identify what you want out of life and to go for it at all costs because no one else is going to give it to you if you don't hustle and get it for yourself, that you need to pursue your happiness and your success and your purpose. And the reason that our children and the reason that our grandchildren buy into this is because we bought into it first and we sold it to them. We told them this is what life was. And our enemy wants nothing more than to twist the words of Jesus When he says that life is found in taking up your cross, dying to yourself, that's where life is. He wants to take those words and twist them and he wants them to be called repressive and naive and foolish and even morally wrong to self-denial. Do not deny yourself. Pursue what you want. The only way, though, to resist the lie is to experience the truth. To choose, I'm going to give of myself even if it feels like you're missing out or maybe it even feels like your kids are missing out and to trust that when the chief shepherd appears that he will lift you up and he will reward you with a crown of glory that you have awaited. And believe it or not, he had a crown of glory and it felt like a crown of thorns. Because life in his kingdom, it is service. And if you humble yourself and you look to the interest of others, This is what life in his kingdom looks like. And if there is any community that was meant to help us to do this, it should be the church where each of us, I don't have to look out for my interest because you're looking out for my interest. I can look out for your interest because we're both looking out for one another. So what are you going to do about it? Give us time to talk about this. I've asked Ed to come and lead us in a time of prayer where we can talk with God about what our next step in being humble truly is. Thank you.